All right, looks like we've got a pretty good group online. So I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for for joining us today. I'm uh, very excited to introduce our our two panelists. Um, the um, the chair for our attorney well-being section, Joanna McCracken, is actually going to to lead this discussion with with Dr. Uh, Beth Mallow. Um, Dr. Mallow is uh, the professor and vice chairs for academic affairs at the Department of Neurology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and is the director of the sleep division. Uh, she has worked with uh, public and policymakers to uh, advocate for um, ending daylight savings time and or the benefits of ending daylight savings time as a proposed a number of uh, opinion pieces and participated with CBS News, PBS News Hour, NPR, among many others. And uh, she actually presented for us at our convention recently um, regarding regarding uh, sleep science. So uh, we heard that presentation and said we need more. So um, invited her back. And Joanna, um, like I said, is is chair of our attorney well-being committee and also a uh, yoga instructor, um, among many other things. I, I, Joy and I cannot list all of your accolades and activities because I can't keep up with them all. <laughs> so, uh, but she is uh, a great friend of the bar and attorney wellness. So I'm, I'm really excited about today's discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you, Joanna. Well, thank you so much, Jared. <laughs> it was very flattering. Um, but I don't wanna take up any time speaking myself because I am really excited to hear from you, Dr. Mallow. Uh, so I'm just gonna get started into some questions. This is uh, about time change. So can you just tell us a bit about the history of time change? Absolutely. It's a really interesting history and, and thank you for asking. I'll, I'll try to not take a whole hour with the history, uh, but in a nutshell, Basically, we started the time change in the wars, World War I, World War II. Actually, Europe started first, Germany, and then um, England. And they realized, or they thought, you know, if we could save some energy costs uh, for the war effort by moving daylight from the morning to the evening, uh, that would be really great. Because at that time, electrical energy was the big energy cost. And People were waking up at you know a reasonably good time, but then they were needing that light later in the day. So that was what motivated people to do daylight saving time. It's not really daylight saving time. It's more daylight shifting time, if you think about it, because you're shifting your light from morning to evening. And then it, it wasn't very popular during the wars. A lot of people didn't want to get up in the dark. Uh, so they got rid of it. But then eventually in the 60s, all sorts of towns and cities were doing different things. Uh, so the Congress said, this is really messing things up with, with railroads and all. And they went ahead and uh, passed the Uniform Time Act in 1966. And what that did was it allowed uh, for seasonal daylight saving time, which used to be shorter than it is now. It used to be um, April to October rather than um, March to November. And, uh, and then we would get off of it in the winter. Uh, and they allowed states to, this is really interesting politically, they allowed states to opt out. Um, and just stay on standard time year round. And Arizona and Hawaii opted to do that. But the rest of the country went to the seasonal daylight saving time. And then we, we pretty much have that today. We had a short stint in 1974 that we can talk about later where we went to year round daylight saving time again. And it was very unpopular. Kids were going to school in the dark with flashlights. <laughs> but oh, wow. um, yeah, but other than that, we pretty much stayed on seasonal daylight saving time. Okay. Well, that's really helpful. I do want to just let everybody who's watching, I think Jared already uh, put a note in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to try our best to leave some time at the end for questions. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we will do our best to make sure there's time to answer them. Um, so Dr. Mallow, what are the two different times? Because I know when I first spoke to you, I know the time changes twice a year, but I was confused about what was called what 
So, and why? So if you could just tell us, that would probably be helpful. I know I can't be the only person who didn't understand that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry, say the question one more time again. So what are the two different oh, times? That we got have? it, got it. No, no, I think that's a great question and it's not always intuitive. So we have standard time and then we have daylight saving time. Um, which I prefer to call daylight time or in Europe, they call it summertime. Um, because as I said, you're not really saving time, but the, the standard time is called standard time because that's the time that we always were on before we started messing with our clocks. And the way it would be set is it's as, as close to the sun being overhead at noon as you can get. Now, you can't get it overhead at noon everywhere because otherwise we'd have a zillion time zones, but it's it approximates sun overhead at noon. And the reason that's important is because that's aligned with our biology um, and that's felt to be the more healthy natural time. The daylight saving time is where everything is shifted by one hour. So rather than it being uh, the sun is overhead at noon, the sun is now overhead at one in the afternoon, which makes for longer, or I should say more light in the late afternoon and early evening compared to the morning. And the challenge is we can't create more light. Uh, we can only shift our light around, uh, which is what the, the daylight saving time does. So why are we considering eliminating these changes now? Well, it's a great question. Over time, people have gotten, first of all, progressively annoyed with going back and forth. Uh, I see this every year when I'm asked to do these news interviews. People are just tired of it. Even if our clocks change automatically, it, um, it can be really annoying. It can cause people to feel really tired and fatigued because not only are you losing an hour of sleep, if you think about it, you're waking up an hour earlier when we go on to daylight saving time. It's a little confusing because when we talk about moving the clocks forward by an hour, you have to think about that for a minute. But what's really happening is you're waking up an hour earlier and you're losing an hour of sleep when we move the clock forward. I, I find it easy to explain by just telling people you're getting less light in the morning and you know, you're getting more light later in the day. And, and that seems to help um, people grasp the concept. But, but in addition to that, um, being annoying and feeling fatigued, there also is this um, uptick. It's, it's a small uptick, but it's an uptick in heart attacks, strokes, um, medical errors, you know, your doctors and nurses are not going to be as sharp uh, when we switch the clocks around. And then there's even traffic accidents. And the way I explain the traffic accidents is here you are driving to work at your usual time, let's say seven in the morning, and then daylight saving time happens. And it's now an hour darker. But the people around you don't usually turn their lights on, let's say. They're, they're used to there being some light in the morning or whatever. So now it's, it's dark and their lights aren't on because of force of habit. And that can actually contribute to heart, I'm sorry, to, um, to traffic accidents because it's an abrupt shift. Uh, if we did it naturally and we just let it become lighter as the, as the days goes on, we wouldn't have that problem. Um, that we do with making this abrupt shift in, in the clock. So that's, all of that is why people have said, we need to really get rid of this. Why are we doing it? It's really antiquated. It's also not clear that it saves energy because we've gone from focusing on lighting to we now have very efficient LED lights and we use our energy 24 seven for our computers and gadgets and all. Um, so it's not even clear that the real reason for starting this custom and ritual is even at play anymore. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and so generally, I just want to find out what the pros and cons are of, you know, having either 
permanent daylight savings, which is what we think of as the summer extended light in the evening time versus the pros and cons of have going to permanent standard time, which is what we always used to have. If you yeah, can well, let me, let me start with the, um, the health aspects of going to standard time. And then I do want to, I think it's important for everyone who's listening today to understand the benefits of daylight saving time, because, you know, if there weren't any benefits, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would have gotten rid of it a long time ago and gone to standard time. And, and it's, it's, I think, important to, to, to know it's a trade-off. Um, now, as a doctor, as a health professional, I truly believe the benefits of standard time outweigh the benefits of daylight saving time. And I'm joined by I don't know, 20 or so medical health organizations. There's a lot of sleep doctors and, and medical doctors, even the American Medical Association recently endorsed uh, year-round standard time, permanent, we call it permanent standard time, year-round standard time. Um, the reason for that is it's not just that acute jolt to our system in March. We're really one hour off for most of the year until we go back to standard time in November. And we just aren't getting that light in the morning that we need. We, we're getting like an hour or less of light if you think about it, because that morning light aligns, first of all, it aligns our brains with the outside world. You might've heard about circadian rhythms or biological rhythms. We need that light to align our hormones, to align our brains, all of the different functions in our body. And then light also wakes us up. It boosts our mood. People who have a seasonal affective disorder or seasonal depression, they need that light in the morning. We give them uh, light boxes and we ask them to use them in the morning because that's when it's most beneficial. And then it even that light even helps us when we go to sleep at night. It helps the light in the morning aligns our brain so that we can get to sleep in an early hour, you know, a good hour at night. Um, so that's that's why, you know, it maximizes sleep. And, and without going into too much detail, we know that sleep improves uh, weight control. It fights obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, it boosts our immune system. We're more productive and happier when we sleep. We're less apt to send that tweet or email that we might regret later when we've gotten a good night's sleep. So, I mean, I could spend an hour on the benefits of sleep. I'm a sleep doctor, but I'll just leave it there and say standard time optimizes morning light, which improves alignment with our brains in the outside world, which improves sleep. So on that note, um, Dr. Mallow, if, uh, if we were to go to permanent daylight savings time, um, would that mean, you know, that we would be waking up in the dark for school and for work at certain yeah. months of the year? Yeah, so let me get into that. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and let me just start out by saying that, like many of you who are listening, I love it when I get out of work and it's light. You know, I, I like to go for a run. I like to play with my kids are grown now, but I'd like to play with my kids. Um, I like to socialize with people. It's definitely nice to have that light. And that's the trade-off here, I think. You know, people really appreciate that afternoon light, that early evening light. And um, that's what you get with daylight saving time. Um, however, I'll make two points. First of all, the light is still there. It's still going to be there, even if we go to standard time. A lot of people just assume because it's dark in in March or whatever, you know, with standard time or whatever, that it's going to be dark in April, May, June, um, in the early evening, the late afternoon. But it's not because as the days go on and we get from spring into summer, the days get longer. So we are gonna have light. I looked it up, it's like fairly late, like eight o'clock or later in East Tennessee and seven o'clock or later in um, most of the rest of the state. So, you know, deception number one or, or idea number one is we still will have a fair amount of light 
in the late afternoon and evening, even on standard time. And then, as you say, the, the trade-off is if we want our light in the afternoon, if we want maximal light under year-round standard time in the afternoon and evening, we're going to have to pull it out of the morning. We can't have it both ways. So what happens is it's not a big deal most of the year, but if you look at those winter months, November, December, January, February, we're talking about dark mornings. And I, again, you can go to the, um, you can go to these websites and look up in your city what it's going to be like in January. And I've done this. And, and for example, in Chattanooga, it's going to be 10 to 9 in the morning before they have sunrise in the middle of January. And that's really dark, especially when you look at schools and a lot of schools start at 7, 7.30. So these kids are going to school in the pitch black um, for much of the winter. And um, that's something that is what, in 1974, when we tried it as a nation, it was, it went from, I think, being like, the popularity was in the 70s, I think it was like 79%, and it fell to 42% among Americans, the daylight saving time, 42%. Um, in two months, there was that precipitous drop of 79% to 42% because people did not want to send their kids to school in the dark and they were sending them to the schools with flashlights. And this was when school started at 8.30, right? And now it starts a lot earlier. Um, so I think that's the biggest reason. Or if you're, if you're someone who has to get up and be somewhere uh, at 7, 7.30, uh, an essential worker, firefighter, medical professional who has to be at the hospital or the clinic seeing people, um, police, school teachers, uh, farmers, all of these essential workers are going to be waking up in the dark if we went to year round um, daylight saving time. And that's not healthy, you know, for the reasons I discussed. And we certainly don't want <laughs> our firefighters and police and doctors and teachers to not be awake and alert, right? So that's why <laughs> I think we should we should be on standard time. Just as an attorney who has court hearings at eight, eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, I don't want to have to get up and <laughs> be going to those when it's still dark um, either. It's um, and you want to be at your sharpest, right? You want to be completely. You want to be at your sharpest. Days. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you've testified for Congress. So I think it's, you know, I, I already see one um, question that we'll, we'll be asking um, that I think is probably relevant to this. So what is going on in Congress right now regarding this issue? Yeah, great question. So last year when I testified, it was in March of 2022, the, um, the Senate uh, actually, well, there's so the Senate and the House. Um, the Senate actually had actually passed year round daylight saving time. It was called the Sunshine Protection Act, but the House did not. I testified for the House, the Energy and Commerce Committee, and that was a great experience. Oh my goodness, I respect lawyers so much for the work you do and, and having to do all these testimonies and, and, and all in court and all. I, um, I really appreciated that the House committee members asked some great questions of me. I focused on the health aspects, um, but um, I think that after hearing my testimony, I was very pleased they decided that they wanted to not act not pass year-round daylight saving time, but try to get more information, including on energy costs, including on uh, what was going on with commerce and all. Um, and they they really did take the health aspect, aspect seriously, even though they were the Energy and Commerce Committee. So that was really heartening to me. Um, but as I said, the Senate did pass the uh, Sunshine Protection Act. Because only the Senate did and the House did not, the legislation uh, ended at when when Congress ended its session. So now we're in a brand new session uh, that started in January 2023, 
And again, the bill has been introduced. The bill has been introduced by um, Senator Rubio about four or five years in a row. And it, it just doesn't seem to get the traction that it needs. Again, it's it's working its way through committees and people are looking at it. But I think the challenge is it's not interestingly enough political diversity, it's more geographic diversity. So people on both sides of the aisle are pro daylight saving time or pro standard time. I mean, there's, there's people on both sides, but it's more where you live. Uh, so for example, just like Chattanooga, would see sunrise at 10 to nine in the morning in January under year round daylight saving time. Indianapolis would see sunrises at 9.07 a.m., which is super early. Um, and the reason is because like it's Chattanooga, late. they're on the Western edge of the time zone. Uh, they're on the Western edge of the Eastern time zone. Um, Michigan is in a similar boat. Um, Minneapolis, some of the Dakotas. So, so the idea here is that parts of the country are really going to be um, affected even more so than others by the um, year-round daylight saving time and the dark mornings particularly. Uh, and that's why I don't think this is going to go anywhere soon um, because a lot of people, even apart from the health benefits, these public safety issues that we talked about with the kids going to school. I mean, even if you made school start times 830, which is what we're trying to do as a nation, uh, we can't, it's still going to be dark when the kids are getting up and getting ready to go to school. Uh, and that's in the winters. And that's why I think um, this is going to have to be done more on a like uh, region regional approach, which is what we we took in Tennessee with our legislation, that we would do it as a region as opposed so, to a state. So that, that um, brings me to my next question. I know you have testified at the state level. Can you tell us what's going on in Tennessee at the moment? Yeah, I can. You know, I was really, really pleased with how things went this year. We, I, I introduced um, a we introduced a bill, um, Senator uh, Heidi Campbell and uh, Representative Caleb Hemmer, both from both Democrats from Nashville, although we also had um, significant um, Republicans in the committees we testified before who are quite um, supportive of year round standard time. What's interesting is that Tennessee passed the year round daylight saving time back in 2019 when there was a lot of momentum going on in Congress. Um, and we had to talk to the same committees that passed that. So we crafted the legislation in such a way um, where we were not saying we're overthrowing or overturning your legislation from 2019. We just want a path forward. So that legislation can still exist. And should the federal government be successful in getting all the states on board and everybody aligned to, to have permanent year-round daylight saving time, great. You know, we weren't gonna say your legislation is not gonna go through, but we said, but let's let's have another piece of legislation that can coexist with yours because we feel that um, as a state, especially working in conjunction with other states, um, we're going to be able to exempt out, you know, we're going to, we don't have to wait for the federal government to figure this out, which may never happen, right, given the geographic diversity of our country. Instead, Tennessee, in conjunction with our um, neighboring states, can decide to opt out, end the clock change, which everybody wants to get rid of, and land on year-round standard time, because that's what the Uniform Time Act from 1966 stipulates. We, we can exempt out as a state and do that. Um, so that was our argument. And it really, I think, went fairly well. We got through the Senate committee. We were going to have a floor vote on the Senate. We also um, got through a, a major subcommittee of the House um, we didn't make it through a subcommittee of, you know, a full committee of the House. And honestly, I, I think it was a combination of things. I think that 
the focus in our legislature turned to, um, you know, after the tragic covenant um, shooting, really turned to that issue, and which I get. I mean, I, I think that's where they had to put their attention. And also, I think that, like, we were trying to explain our bill and that it wasn't going to counteract the bill from 2019. We were trying to explain that to legislators, and they were getting a thousand emails, right, a day on, on gun safety and gun reform and all. Um, it was it was not a great time to advance a daylight saving time bill, um, or I should say an end daylight saving time bill. Um, so we're going to also make it clearer in the next um, legislative session that this this bill is truly not intended to get rid of what has been passed already. It's just an, another option for people moving forward who want to end daylight saving time and are getting frustrated with the federal government not acting. So I know that's a long-winded explanation, but I wanted to provide that, particularly if anyone is listening and wants to help. Um, I have my email up here, bethmallow at gmail.com, and I would be thrilled to have you involved with writing your legislator or testifying or whatever, you know, suits your fancy, um, because we we really think this is the best, healthiest option for um, Tennesseans going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like the rest of most people probably um, always wanted to wish we could keep the um, daylight savings because who doesn't love like long summer evenings? I mean, but what you're saying is we're still going to have long summer evenings. It's just going to end like an hour earlier, which is it's still going to be light for a long time. Um, and uh, the reason that you and I got connected was because I personally got extremely interested in in sleep. I'd had personal sleep issues. My husband had had personal sleep issues. So I really wanted to understand sleep. And there aren't that many sleep scientists out there. And I ended up reading a really brilliant book um, called Why We Sleep um, by a, a British sleep scientist, Dr. Matthew Walker. And that after reading that, I changed everything around how I sleep. But sleep is like I prioritize it. It is, and it has remained my absolute priority because once I understood the how important your circadian rhythm is, how much that impacts every aspect of your health, well-being, longevity, like your physical health, mental health, your mood, just absolutely everything, even down to these things like whether or not you gain weight, like it just, uh, it was really staggering understanding that no other creatures wake up to alarm clocks, just human beings. And I can say that I've now got my sleep schedule and sort of sleep routines down to the point where I maybe use an alarm once every couple of months and it has to be like, I'm going to the airport or something. I don't ever need an alarm clock. I have got that down. Um, but I imagine that if it starts, if it's dark, I always wake up when the sun's coming up. And so like, that's a natural thing. So, it, you know, I'll have to go back to using an alarm clock if my body has to start waking up during while it's still dark outside. And that concerns me having done my own research on that. Um, I do want to, I'm going to go ahead and ask one of these questions just because I think it's, it's pertinent to what you were just talking about. And this is such a critical sort of issue right now. Um, so it, uh, one of the questions is, uh, you seem to be advocating for permanent standard time, but my understanding is that most politicians who are addressing the issue are pushing for permanent daylight saving time. Why is that? Yeah, so I... I think there's both going on. I mean, when I look at the different states and what's happening with legislation, there's definitely bills for permanent standard time and permanent daylight saving time. I think we're we're seeing more in the news because, um, you know, the the Sunshine Protection Act, the Year Round Daylight Saving Time Act, has been um, put forward nationally um, by. Uh, Senator Rubio, and that's in the news. Um, but I, I do think there, um, there is arguments on both sides. And as I said, it is bipartisan, which is is pretty exciting in these days when it's it's hard to agree on things. 
Um, I do think the politicians who are in support of year-round daylight saving time, um, I do think that there does tend to be sometimes a momentum where a certain number will be in favor and then other people will be like, well, let's go ahead and just do that because it really doesn't matter what we do and maybe that's easier because other people are doing it. You know, there's that. Um, and then I also think that um, it's a little deceiving this, this idea that like right now we're on daylight saving time almost eight months of the year from March to November. So people are like, well, why don't we just stay on it? Because then we're on at 12 months as opposed to being on standard time from November to March. And now we want to go to standard time the whole year. I mean, it sounds like a good argument when you first think about it. But remember how dark it's going to be. You know, there's a reason that when we change our clocks back and forth, we um, are on standard time in the winter um, because that, I mean, when, when things were first put into place in 1966 with the Uniform Time Act, um, people realized that's a really, really dark time. So what I, the approach I've taken with, with politicians is, and legislators is to just to try to explain the science to them as well as the public safety aspects, uh, which are probably equally important in their eyes um, and when you explain it and and you actually, as we did, talk about um, what's happening with the light, you know, because a lot of times it's hard to even figure out what it means. Um, I've had politicians say, I've heard them say that when you turn the clocks ahead, you're gaining an extra hour, you're actually losing an hour, but it's it's not always intuitive. So explaining the science, explaining the public health aspects, explaining and showing them data on how dark it will be in the mornings. And as I said, it's really, really important, I think, to show that under standard time, it's not going to be dark at 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, that's one of the beautiful things about spring and summer is the days get longer. And um, I think that making those arguments um, carries a lot of weight and, and goes a long way. So um, what, uh, speaking of the different times, what's, I mean, what times will it get light and dark in the different parts of Tennessee? This is for the Tennessee Bar Association. Um, if we stay, if we, you know, go to permanent daylight savings time or permanent standard time. Yeah, so I'll give you a rough. Know, I'll like, just give you a rough estimate. So when I when I when I think about East Tennessee, which is most susceptible because it's on, as I said, the western edge of the Eastern Time Zone, um, what we would be looking at, I mentioned Chattanooga in January is about ten to nine a.m. sunrise. So when you look at the western part of the Eastern Time Zone, let's just say Eastern East Tennessee to keep it simple. Um, we're looking at sunrises in January of around 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning, if we were to go to year-round permanent um, daylight saving time. Um, and then you can kind of back out from that for some of the other winter months. Um, but we're, we're looking at at least past 8 o'clock most of the winter, 8 a.m. Uh, for sunrises in most of East Tennessee. Now, the rest of the state is a little better. Um, you know, as you go more west, it's confusing, but as you go more west in the central time zone, it's actually, you start getting darker again, um, darker mornings. Um, so looking at, um, you know, past eight o'clock in, in some parts of Western Tennessee um, in, in the winter, like in January. Um, Nashville is actually not that bad. We'd be looking at 7.30 to 8 a.m.-ish um, sunrises, but that's still kind of late, right? So, um, so it's important to realize there is a lot of geographic diversity. Now, on the flip side, if we were to go to year-round standard time in the spring and summer, um, in the spring, 
it would still be light in East Tennessee at eight o'clock in the evening. So there'd be plenty of time or later. So that would give us plenty of time for, for outdoor activities. And it would be 7 p.m. or later in most of the rest of the state. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can actually go to um, websites that give you sunrises and sunsets, plug in your city and see for yourself uh, what you're dealing with. I think you'll be surprised because I didn't realize until I actually started making these little charts that it was that dark in parts of Tennessee um, in the winter if we were to go to stand, you know, daylight saving time. Um, and then it would still be fairly light in the summer with standard time. Remember when you do that, if you do that research on your own, you just have to keep in mind that the way the charts are set up now is in June, it's reflecting what daylight saving time would look like. So you'd have to subtract an hour and vice versa. If you're looking at January um, sunrises, you would um, basically um, be switching the time around as well to reflect that we're on standard time rather than daylight saving time. Uh, do you, you may be able to tell from my accent that I'm not from these parts. I'm from, from Europe, from, from um, England and my family actually lives in Spain. Um, but they also have, you know, the time change. Do you know if this is like a global, a uh, possible global change? Are we going to change in Europe as well and, and other countries that still have that time change? Yes, um, that's a great question. Before COVID hit, the European Union wanted every country to basically choose either to, to be on standard time or to be on what they call summertime, which is their version of daylight saving time. Um, and um, with COVID, that kind of threw a wrench into it, but I think there's now a movement afoot to do that again and to try to get rid of going back and forth because you can imagine it's it's confusing enough um, being you know with all these different time zones in the world, but then when you add in daylight saving time, it's even more confusing. So for example, we went, we, we went to Italy last year, there was a big sleep meeting and um, what happened was we had gone to daylight saving time in the U.S., but Italy had not gone to daylight saving time yet. They were going to go at the end of March, and we went second week of March. So there was this disconnect between what we were doing in the U.S. and what we were doing in other countries, um, and it's all super confusing. Um, so the idea of at least everybody being on one time all year round <laughs> Even if it's daylight, you know, even if it's, it's summertime for some or, you know, and standard time for others would be a huge improvement. And, yeah. you know, the World Sleep Society is is trying to get the word out to all these countries that standard time is healthier. And in fact, Mexico um, is now on, the country of Mexico is now on year-round standard time. And I Think. I'd have to look this up, but I want to say that about 60% of countries are on uh, standard time too. So people have uh, definitely embraced standard time uh, globally. I think that's really, um, you know, it's interesting because my parents live in Spain and, and like you just said, the time does time change doesn't even occur the same day that it does in America. So when I'm calling my parents who are six hours ahead, there's like a uh, you know, a week or two where they're like, you know, seven hours ahead. It just, it really changes. Um, and also just, you know, it's funny to me that they even have daylight savings or what they call summertime in Europe, because at least growing up in the UK, uh, we went to summertime and um, it wouldn't get dark till like 10, 10 30 at night, which just seemed weird I remember you know in my misspent youth leaving you know leaving a pub uh at like 10 10 30 at night and it was still light outside it was really odd oh, and yeah. same with my yeah my parents in Spain now when I go and visit them and they're on you know they're on the savings daylight savings time it doesn't get light until 
eight o'clock in the morning and it doesn't get dark till about 10 o'clock at night where they are. And it just is, feels very unnecessary. It feels like it would be better if it was getting dark at nine and getting light at, at seven in the morning and in uh, the summer. So I'm hoping it, there's, there'll be some change all over. Of course, may, we may go to, everyone may choose to go to, to daylight savings and, and not the standard time, but you certainly have me convinced that standard time would be better. Well, uh, better health. <laughs> You know, and, 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 I, and I just want to, I have to tell my story. I, I love to talk about when I lived in Michigan and then we were up in Minneapolis on July 4th last summer. And you have to wait until after 10 o'clock at night to start the fireworks. And it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm thinking, oh no. And all the kids who need to get to sleep, right? And, and that I didn't emphasize it because there's so many other aspects, but that light at night actually interferes with our ability to fall asleep because we needed to get dark to release melatonin, our own natural melatonin, not the kind we buy at the store. And we that happens about two hours before um, we're ready to go to bed. Um, so it needs to get dark. So if it doesn't get dark till past 10, we're not going to be able to release our melatonin until after 10 o'clock at night. And then we're not going to be able to get to bed until midnight. And then other people like recently, I've been talking with astronomers who really appreciate a dark night sky so that they can do their stargazing. I mean, there's so many different people who really are affected by um, these time changes that we think are, are inconsequential, but they really are. Yeah. I will say um, I lived in... Um... Tanzania for a year um, back a long time ago my very early 20s I lived in Tanzania for a year and I lived right by the equator and there was no time change because it, the sun rose every morning at six and it set every evening at six year round there was there was no seasons except rainy season and dry season but otherwise it just like clockwork it was you know sun up at six and sun down at at, at six and it was actually really nice. I, I really liked it. It was really a nice rhythm for your body to have. Um, so anyway, and I know we can't have that because we're in all different time zones. And on that note, we actually have a question. Um, do you have an opinion on reducing the number of time zones in the U.S.? <laughs> or increasing them, maybe? I don't yeah, know. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a Well... The, the challenge with reducing them is then more of us are going to be off kilter. Like I mentioned, the western edge of the time, the eastern time zone, western edge of the central time zone. So if you have fewer time zones, you have more people, more population who aren't really getting that sun overhead, right? At noon, they're way not getting that overhead. And some people, um, there's a... Uh, an author named Gentry who actually has published on it's less about the time change and more about where you're living in your ideal time zone like if you're in what he calls an eccentric time zone where you're not quite where you should be you know the sun is way not overhead at noon um, it's going to have health consequences he specifically studied traffic accidents um, but others have studied, you know, this idea of, of being, not being where you should be, um, not having the ideal um, sun overhead at noon situation. Um, so I think having fewer time zones would be more problematic. Some people have questioned whether adding a time zone or rearranging the time zones could have some merit. Um, for example, do we want to think about going to, you know, the East Coast? I mean, should parts of the East Coast be potentially in, in an Atlantic time, right? And then have five time zones and then rearrange things so that you don't have, for example, um, a lot of the country that's, um, you know, in the Eastern time zone. I mean, I think we all love Eastern time zone and it came to be because everybody wanted to be on the same time zone as the major Eastern state cities, but um, it may be actually healthier for people to be in a time zone that aligns better with the, um, with the light. So I would say more time zones rather than less, but then you're dealing with, I mean, it's already confusing, right? To have four time zones. 
Uh, so it's a tr again, it's a trade off. Yeah, I think it, and uh, you know, America being made up of states is, you know, then each state. Well, it's interesting as well because not like not all states are in the same. A single state could have multiple time zones, as we know in Tennessee, um, which I've always thought is interesting. And it, as far as I know, in, in Europe, it's not that case. Like, not every European country is on the same time, but each country, I think, the whole country is on the is on the same time. Um, I may be wrong about that, but as as far as I know, um, so that's yeah. Uh, I think. Let me just think about that for a minute. I know that. Um, yeah, different countries will have different time zones. And um, I think like Russia tried to have all of the same time zone at one time and it was really unpopular and they actually got rid of the one time zone, which is you know unusual for Russia, I guess, to do something <laughs> that focused, it, uh, focused on the health and well-being of their citizens, but they did. And it was it was good, I mean, in a way. So I think that um you know, there, there are some really quirky things in Europe with time zones. Um, if people want to dig deeper and in, in, in look on the web on that. Um, but a lot of it is geopolitical and different countries having wanted to be aligned with other countries at various points in our his, in their history. Um, so they they could end up in the wrong time zone. Again, always think about if you want to keep keep it simple, it's it's where the sun is closest to being overhead at noon is is standard time and that's what we want to do with the time zones too that's fascinating i never realized that that was i've always wondered like what decided standard time in the first place and it makes total sense the sun being overhead at noon my kids or my parents always told me growing up that's the hottest part of the day is noon because that's when the sun's overhead um, and I imagine part of it is also like what countries or states or you know decide to do ultimately may also be sort of cultural for example I know I keep talking about Spain because my parents live there and I, I'm there a lot um, they people don't go out to dinner until you know 10 o'clock like if, if they know if you're a, a tourist because if you're trying to get dinner at 8 p.m they're like that is really early. Spanish people do not eat dinner that early. So, but right, but and they also o'clock. take a siesta, right? They they take yeah. a nap after in the afternoon, yeah. and and I I'm all for that, right? You are too, right? Maybe if we did that here, it would be okay to stay on um, daylight savings time if everybody didn't. If school started at like nine or ten o'clock in the morning, and work office hours started at nine ten o'clock in the morning, it might be might work a bit a, a yeah, bit better. I mean, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because the other point I always make to people, because people will say to me, you know, I wake up at nine o'clock. I don't have to worry about the dark. I don't, you know, I, I can schedule my activities. I have blackout curtains. I'm good. Um, you're absolutely right. And that that is true for you. The challenge is we have to fit this all in, you know, the school kids not going to school in the dark and the essential workers. And I mean, it's 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 one of those things where you're absolutely right. If we could individualize schedules to people's needs, I mean, that's the ultimate health and wellness. Right. Um, the problem is we can't and um, or we're not going to as a society, whatever. So. We still have to have people who have to be at work at seven or in court at an early hour, or whatever. Um, so because of that, it's challenging. I mean, it's and that's where I, I feel like as a society, we just have to make these choices and say, well, um, let's go with standard time because it's going to be healthiest for our kids, right? And our essential workers. Um, but I really, really value my light and my afternoon activities year round. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can switch my hours around where I can work earlier and get out and still have time. Um, I think that's the ultimate, after, you know, the ultimate wellness. And I will say in Arizona, it's super hot, right? We hear about temperatures of 115 degrees. So what they do is they actually are exempt. They're on year-round uh, daylight, uh, year-round standard time. 
So they play golf in the morning and they go for runs in the morning. And that way it's cooled off at night and it's easier, you know, to exercise. And they do a lot of things in the morning and they have their morning light from the standard time to do that. Um, so, you know, I think people do adjust. So it's, it's, it sounds like, you know, either way could work if we're, you know, open as a society to making other, that's not the only change, but we're also open to changing, you know, other aspects of how we live. And I think honestly, thanks to COVID, there's so much more flexibility um, with those things, but there are certain things that haven't changed. Like you mentioned, school start times, I'm, you know, it's horrifying thinking of teenagers going to school already at 7 a.m. Um, so if that then became, you know, what to their body is 6 a.m. is, you know, it's just, it's so unhealthy for them. And it, it's, uh, you know, we, we probably need to do, make some other changes if we want to go to permanent uh, daylight savings, has to be some other changes to help our, help uh, mitigate the, the health uh, fallout from. Yeah, um, I mean, one positive from all of this is I know that Florida, which is where Marco Rubio is with his daylight, you know, a Sunshine Protection Act year on daylight saving time. Florida is actually has a movement to, to start the um, schools, the uh, middle and high schools closer to 830. Um, so that could be a positive thing that comes out of all of this, right, um, is the yeah. attention on the school kids and the getting the kids um, to be able to start school later, although it's still a challenge, as, as we talked about, if, even if school starts at 830, you're getting yourself up at 730, you got to catch the bus. Um, and if your you're, sun rises isn't until nine o'clock, <laughs> you're not going to, there's no way you can make school late enough to counter that. Right. <laughs> I'm sure my 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 teenagers, uh, household of teenagers, and I'm sure they would all be very happy if school started at 10 a.m. And they probably <laughs> all do better. Well, they probably actually all thrive getting enough sleep because teenagers' circadian rhythm is naturally. Yeah, um, I mean that's a whole other topic. One of the things that got me started, I got the advocacy bug in in 2015. Uh, 2016, uh, we were able to make Williamson County schools where my kids were in school 20 minutes later. So we went from 720 to 740, which doesn't sound like a huge deal, but it was um, for the kids, even for our family, we were waking up at 630 in the morning instead of six uh, to get the kids ready. Um, so I do think that um, you know, the biggest thing I love about this and why I do it, um, in addition to being a media star twice a year, is I do feel like it's it gets people thinking about sleep and the importance of sleep and health and well-being. Uh, it, it's a great way to, to get people turned on to sleep, even if they listen to me and say, I think, I think I like the daylight saving time. And I mean, at least they understand it. And as long as people understand it, I, I can't argue with that. I just, I just want to make sure, you know, people understand that when we move the clocks around it, it does have health consequences. Yeah. And I think that's it. I think it's making an informed decision. I think at the moment, so few of us are, are even informed about what, what it means, what the implicate, what all the implications are. And we've only got a, a, a couple of minutes left here, Dr. Mallow. So the last thing I just wanted to ask you is, um, you know, if people do want to approach the legislature about their concerns or support for either one, how would they go about that? Yeah, so um, we have a small group of concerned uh, healthcare professionals in Tennessee, and I'm also joined, I mean, I've got some advocates from disabilities communities. I've got Joanna is, a, is an ally as well, as you've heard. I mean, if you want to reach out to me, or you could reach out to Joanna, if, if you're comfortable with that, Joanna, um, you know, and you can connect them with me. Um, we are planning to reintroduce uh, this bill in the next legislative session next January, although um, it definitely takes um, some time, prep time to get sponsors and everybody lined up. 
Um, and uh, we would be very eager to have anyone on board, you know, ranging from look over the bill, make sure it makes sense to people, especially with your law background, um, writing to legislators, testifying to legislators, having small group discussions with people. Um, there's a lot of different things. Getting sponsors, finding, I'd love to get some uh, Republican sponsors because it, it's not about politics. It's not Democrat versus Republican. It's it's um, you know it's it's about health and well-being for the Tennesseans. So um, you let me know if feel free to reach out to me. My email is right here, bethmallow at gmail.com, um, or you can reach out to Joanna, and we'd love to have you involved. Great. Um, yes. Yeah, so Dr. Mallow, as she said, her uh, email address is on her screen next to her screen name. Uh, mine is not, but you can find me online. It's, uh, it's joanna at mccracken.law, joanna at mccracken.law. Um, you can look me up online. It's pretty easy to find me. I'd be happy to speak to anyone as well. Um, I appreciate your time so much today. Um, do you have any sort of closing comments before we, we end this? I just want to say thank you for listening. And there's a wealth of information um, that we can we can share if you're interested. Again, even if you don't want to get active uh, uh, legislatively, if you just want to learn more about this, feel free to reach out and, and we'll share information. And thank you for taking the time. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to to speak with you today. And thank you, Joanna, thank you. for being such a great moderator. Yeah, and on thank the, you so much for that, uh, your time. Yeah, on the behalf of the TBA too, I just wanted to thank you both. That was really, really interesting and time really flew by um, watching it. So I, I appreciate that. Sorry for the bad pun, I had to. But uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> that's a, no, I uh, I wanted to remind our viewers too that uh, the attorney well-being section has been really active in putting together um, these webinars, and we had one last week that was postponed, which was finding the therapist and the importance of therapy. So we're working on a date for that. Um, so just stay tuned and check the TBA calendar because we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of these webinars that are um, informational and fun. I think so. Um, just stay tuned and check back and I appreciate both of you and um, I'll certainly be contacting my legislators and uh, I guess uh, telling them my new opinion now um, since you've, uh, <laughs> you've, you've 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 changed me <laughs> Dr. Molly you switch, you switch my position on this so um, you know you at least have one more advocate now well thank you yeah, no, I mean, thank you, you both. Me, same with me. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, y'all. And um, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much, Jared. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>